All right, so I guess we could get started. Uh, my name is Johan Hedberg. I uh, work for Intel. I've uh, been working with the uh, Zephyr Bluetooth support now for about one and a half years. And um, in this presentation, I'll be going through uh, what exactly it is about Bluetooth that uh, Zephyr supports and what our plans are uh, going ahead. Uh, when we talk about Bluetooth in the context of uh, Zephyr or IoT in general, it's for the most time uh, Bluetooth low energy technology that we are talking about. Um, Bluetooth low energy is something that was introduced relatively recently when you think about how old uh, Bluetooth is as a specification and technology. It came in uh, 2010 and uh, it has several different names that it's been called like uh, BLE or Bluetooth Smart. But this smart, uh, smart was a marketing name that the Bluetooth SIG was using for it, but I think the official term nowadays uh, is Bluetooth Low Energy Technology. They've dropped the Bluetooth Smart part. Um, Bluetooth Low Energy uses the same 2.4 uh, gigahertz um, frequency as uh, traditional Bluetooth. Slightly different, a uh, bit simpler uh, radio modulation than the uh, classic Bluetooth. It has uh, up to 100 meters range. Uh, it is a bit uh, lower bandwidth uh, than traditional Bluetooth where you can go up to three megabits per second. You get one megabit per second with uh, Bluetooth LE. And depending on your usage, you can get many years of battery life, even with small coin cell batteries using uh, Bluetooth low energy. Uh, the kinds of uh, devices that have Bluetooth low en energy uh, are usually categorized uh, based on do they support uh, traditional Bluetooth, Bluetooth Classic or not. So uh, on your PCs or on your phones, you would have so-called dual mode uh, controllers, which have the Bluetooth Classic and Bluetooth LE. And then your small uh, sensors, uh, like low power devices, that would be so-called single mode devices that only support uh, Bluetooth low energy. And uh, the low power consumption uh, makes um, Bluetooth LE the best choice, a very good choice for uh, IoT use cases. So uh, regarding Zephyr support uh, for Bluetooth uh, LE, it supports the very latest uh, Bluetooth 4.2 standard. Um, the uh, main focus, uh, as I ex explained, has been on Bluetooth LE. And uh, we have pretty much like almost all of the features that are available. There are a couple of optional features that we are still working on. Um, some highlights of, of functionality that we have. Uh, we have support for uh, l 2 cup connection or the channels, which is a feature of the 4.1 Bluetooth specification, which is required to do, for example, IPv6 over uh, Bluetooth LE. We also have the um, security update from Bluetooth 4.2 called LE Secure Connections uh, that we support. Uh, we recently started implementing Bluetooth Classic support as well. So uh, if somebody wants to create devices that support both LE and uh, Bluetooth Classic, uh, another name for that, by the way, is uh, BREDR. Uh, stands for Basic Rate Slash Enhanced Data Rate. Um, the Zephyr Bluetooth stack uh, uses uh, standard HCI separation between the uh, host layer and the controller layer. This is something that, that's been a standard interface on uh, Bluetooth controllers for a long, long time. Uh, when Bluetooth Low Energy was introduced, um, a very common scenario for um, uh, single mode controllers was that uh, they wouldn't necessarily have HCI internally if, if they have just a single core. But uh, we've decided to, whether it's, it's a single core or, or multiple cores, to have HCI as the standard because it gives ultimate flexibility on uh, combining different hosts, different controllers. And uh, something which happened just uh, very recently uh, this year is that we also received uh, the layer below HCI, the controller implementation, uh, which basically gives you uh, Bluetooth firmware for your uh, Bluetooth controllers. I'll talk about that a bit more later. Uh, regarding the architecture, uh, so uh, we have, um, this is uh, for the whole stack, I'll, I'll give more details about the controller later. later. So the whole stack at the lowest layer, we have a abstraction called an HCI driver, uh, which abstracts away the details, the, the HCI transport details to the controller. So it, it can be a physical transport like uh, UART or SPI, or um, if you are running the controller on the same CPU, then it would be a, a virtual uh, driver that you would have there. 
Um, the uh, interface to the application side is on the generic uh, access profile uh, layer and uh, the um, uh, gut layer. Actually, I don't have a bullet point for that, but uh, you can see it here um, in, in the uh, diagram. So the, this, uh, the uh, GUP and GUT are basically the main um, interfaces when programming, uh, creating applications with Bluetooth. Um, GUP gives you the generic ways of uh, establishing connections, discovering devices, and so on. And whereas GUT is the main uh, protocol or profile used for uh, communicating with other devices. Uh, the uh, security manager protocol, uh, you, you can request that for connections. It's uh, abbreviated here, uh, SMP. And uh, then we also have the possibility of doing IPv6 over uh, Bluetooth LE, uh, which uh, actually, for the most part, you would um, be using the IP stack interface uh, for doing that. Um, the uh, support when it comes to HCI is fairly complete and well tested. Uh, when we did the development uh, of the stack in, in the early days, we were using a lot of our own uh, controllers, founder laptops, and, and these USB dongles. So we've had quite a lot of uh, different hardware references to verify that it works well against. And uh, pretty much all of the aspects of the stack is configurable depending on what your needs are. So when you make a build, you're not going to have anything unnecessary there uh, consuming uh, memory. Um, how we uh, split this um, during runtime for the whole stack. So we have the HCI driver interface and we have uh, simple APIs for uh, getting data to and from uh, the driver. Um, we, uh, well, this is kind of becoming uh, obsolete with the unified kernel of uh, Zephyr, but originally when we created, uh, we were targeting uh, so that you could have a nano-kernel only system, and that means we use uh, only fibers and nano-kernel objects. Uh, this will now slowly start getting replaced by the unified kernel uh, objects instead. So uh, we have a single uh, receive fiber for data coming from the uh, uh, controller. Uh, for the most time, uh, when we get data from the controller, that's in interrupt context. So we just want to put it quickly to a receive queue and uh, then have the fiber actually process it so we don't take too much time in the interrupt context. And the two kinds of data that we're getting then from there, uh, the uh, RX fiber then either processes connection data, also known as ACL data, or then uh, HCI events. Uh, for sending data out uh, from the device, from the host to the controller, uh, we have two fibers, one for uh, HCI commands, uh, for uh, configuring the controller, for creating connections, and, and so on. Um, the controller exposes its own uh, flow control for the commands, which is why we have a separate fiber for this. So uh, it, the controller, controller tell us, tells us how many HCI commands it's able to receive, and uh, we shouldn't be sending it more commands than that. It will notify when it's ready to get the next command, and so on. And this is actually mapped to a semaphore. Um, in the uh, command transmission fiber. And uh, for connections, uh, the controller also has a separate flow control for that. Um, and uh, because of that, we have a separate fiber. Actually, we have uh, one fiber per connection uh, for uh, sending out data. Uh, the main reason why we have uh, one fiber per, per connection is that um, we can have multiple connections. Connections can come and go. And uh, if a connection gets disconnected, we want to uh, free up any um, outgoing buffers that there are for that connection. And if we had a, a single queue and a single fiber, uh, at least the current objects for those in the kernel, they don't allow you to go inside the queue and remove items. So the simplest way is to have just a single queue and a single uh, fiber per connection. Uh, this is not ideal, and, and it will probably be fixed at some point. There's a new um, poll-based uh, poll API coming at some point this effort, which allows you to wait on multiple different objects at the same time. So we can then potentially shrink um, the uh, connection fibers into a single fiber. It might even be possible then to uh, combine the uh, command, HI command fiber and, and the connection fiber into one. Uh, it's not a huge amount of memory that we are uh, wasting. Um, I think currently the connection fiber uh, stack size is 256 bytes. So that's uh, how much uh, the overhead is per each new connection. Um, regarding the data as it flows through the stack, um, if anybody's familiar with Linux kernel networking, there's a concept there called socket buffers. 
uh, we have something uh, analogous to, uh, on the Zephyr side uh, called uh, network buffers. Uh, the API is very similar to socket buffers. In, in fact, we've copied some of the terminology of the socket buffer, uh, Linux kernel socket buffer API. And uh, both the IP stack in uh, Zephyr as well as the Bluetooth stack uses uh, these uh, network buffers natively everywhere uh, where it goes. So uh, they provide easy APIs for uh, encoding protocol data, decoding protocol data. Uh, also, depending on the NDNS, if you have a little NDN protocol or big NDN protocol, it's very easy to get it from there to host NDN or uh, vice versa. Um, uh, the uh, network buffers provide uh, fragmentation support, so you can have chains of buffers uh, where the data is split into. And uh, by using these on, in all the subsystems, in all the layers, we minimize the uh, need to do uh, copies of the data. The network buffers are also compatible with the uh, kernel objects uh, of Zephyr. So uh, you can use the, the FIFOS, for example, in, in Zephyr to pass the network buffer and to read it then at the other end. And uh, as I mentioned, this is used basically everywhere uh, where we need to have the data passed around. So um, as I mentioned, uh, it's possible to configure pretty much everything when it comes uh, to the Bluetooth uh, functionality. Uh, when you start creating a product or an application, the first thing you do is you, you look at what your requirements are and uh, what exactly the features uh, that you need are. Uh, the first choice would be uh, to look at how is your controller connected. Uh, is it over SPICE the way you are? Or do you have maybe have a single uh, core solution where the controller is running um, on, on the same core, so you would have a virtual driver then for that. And you'll be looking at the features uh, you need, whether you need, uh, which gut roles you need. Uh, there's uh, the peripheral role, which is typically used for uh, uh, sensor type devices. And the central role, uh, which would be used for, uh, for example, your phone connecting to other devices. Uh, you can select uh, all of the different security features. Um, uh, what, what, what you need. Uh, we have a mode for doing the secure connections only, for example, if, if you want uh, like absolute security, not using the uh, legacy uh, security from previous Bluetooth versions, which has some vulnerabilities. Uh, Bluetooth Low Energy has a concept called signing, uh, where you don't need to encrypt the connection to another device, but you can sign the data. This is not a much used feature, at least what I've seen in the market. But uh, we have support for it, and, and you can disable it if you don't need it, or enable it if, if you do need it. Uh, you can specify the exact number of buffers uh, for your needs, uh, how, how big the buffers need to be, depending on the protocol uh, that you're using. Uh, for, uh, since uh, Zephyr doesn't have a dynamic memory allocation, uh, all of this, uh, need, it, it's good to be able to specify all, all of this at build time because then you're not taking any more uh, space than your, your actual use cases require. So you can specify uh, the number of pair devices. Each pair device takes a certain amount of uh, memory because we need to store, I think, some two, three keys per device and, and some, are, some other piece of information. So depending on your needs, you would set that to, to some value. I think, I think it defaults to one. Uh, per device, and then you would increase that depending on how many uh, devices your uh, device needs to support. Uh, the same thing with the connections. So do you want one connection? If, if you're a simple uh, sensor or beacon, uh, well, actually beacon wouldn't have connections, but if you're a simple sensor, you would have just one connection. But if you want to have richer functionality, then you, you can increase the number of supported connections. Uh, if you're a beacon uh, and don't need any connections at all, we allow disabling all connection-related functionality. So you can build a really, really small uh, system that way that doesn't support connections, uh, but you can still do basic uh, advertising and, and scanning uh, for advertising packets using LE. And there's a whole bunch of uh, debug options. Uh, you can enable this per protocol basis in, in the Bluetooth stack to get the debug logs for what you need to debug. Um, once you've selected the configuration uh, that you want, it's time to start actually writing the application. Um, I've uh, given a sample here of a typical um, peripheral, uh, peripheral style uh, application exposing um, a simple service or set of services. So uh, the first thing a Bluetooth application does is it initializes the stack. So we have a BT init uh, API. Uh, it can operate both in blocking and uh, non-blocking mode, so you can give it an optional callback, which then gets called once the uh, stack is finished uh, initializing. Uh, you would register the services that you want to expose. So um, 
I don't know, let's say you have a temperature sensor, so you would have a temperature service uh, exposing that. And once you have the services registered, uh, you would make it possible for other devices to, to discover you and to connect to you. So uh, in Bluetooth Low Energy speak, this is called advertising. So you would do connectable advertising to let others uh, able to, uh, to be able to connect to you. And uh, as devices are connected, uh, you have some kind of sensor which is exporting some value and you want to notify the changes. We have a simple uh, notification API that you call to uh, send out uh, broadcasts of the changes uh, to that uh, sensor. And uh, we have lots of different uh, sample applications uh, for different Bluetooth uh, profiles available in the Zephyr source tree under samples uh, Bluetooth. So that's a good uh, source to start looking at when uh, implementing uh, Bluetooth applications. Um, so a bit more about the uh, development. Uh, when we started creating the stack for Zephyr, uh, our main development environment was simply QM on our uh, Linux laptops. And uh, something that made this very uh, fast and easy for us was the ability for, uh, to use the uh, native controller on our laptops. So we are running, running Linux and um, uh, BlueZ provides a way to expose the HI interface of, of the uh, controllers connected to it. So what we do is we simply uh, have, create a unique socket that QM connects to. It creates a serial port internally, and then we connect up one of the Zephyr uh, UART drivers to that uh, serial port. Uh, the nice thing with this is that uh, we can still see all the data going through HCI on the Linux side, and we can use the uh, Linux uh, tracing tools like BTMon or uh, HCI dump to decode the HCI data and see what's going on. And uh, of course, you get the GDB access also with uh, QML. So once we have the initial support in place, of course, we want to make sure that this works on uh, real devices. And uh, as we uh, transition to those more and more, we've uh, developed some uh, helpers to let you uh, debug better what's happening Bluetooth-wise uh, there. Uh, we have something called the monitor protocol which is a binary uh, protocol which interleaves uh, the uh, HVI traffic at, as well as the normal logs uh, from Zephyr. And uh, with a special uh, kconfig option, you enable it, it, it transforms the, uh, the console UART from a text-based console into this binary protocol. It, it will install its own hooks, so uh, any place in the kernel that does uh, printf or printk, those will actually go through the uh, encoding functions and get transformed into this binary protocol. And then on the other side, uh, we have support with the uh, BlueZ BTMon tool for actually decoding this. So you would give, uh, you would connect your uh, Zephyr board uh, with a serial cable um, or serial to USB to uh, your Linux laptop, and you would run BTMon there. You would give the TTY device uh, to BTMon, and you would then see interleaved all the HCI traffic that happens, as well as all the log messages that happen. And uh, that's a very nice way of uh, tracing what's happening on, on your Zephyr-based uh, board. There's actually another talk uh, after mine uh, in this same room uh, by uh, Louis von Denz. Uh, he's going to talk more about the joint usage of uh, Bluesy and Zephyr and, and how they have benefited each other. So on to the uh, controller implementation I, I mentioned earlier. So. I find this a really no, uh, happy, nice thing because uh, until b before this year, there was basically no uh, Bluetooth, open source Bluetooth firmware implementation available. Uh, and uh, the, all the open source Bluetooth stacks that they were, they were from uh, HCI upward. But uh, early this year, uh, the uh, Minute project released uh, their implementation for uh, Bluetooth controllers. And uh, slowly after, uh, Slowly after, uh, it wasn't. It was, I think, within a month or so after. So it wasn't slowly. Uh, Nordic Semiconductor released their own uh, implementation of the LA controller, uh, and so we basically now have two different options for uh, open source firmwares for Bluetooth controllers. Uh, we've been working together with Nordic uh, now for quite some time, uh, cleaning up the code, making sure it adheres to the Zephyr. Uh, coding style that it takes the maximum benefit out of the infrastructure that we have in Zephyr of the different uh, objects that we have available there and, and uh, interrupts and so on. And it's going to be part of the next uh, Zephyr release. 
the layer, the, the official layer that this actually implements is, is the uh, LE link layer. So that's the one which sits basically between the hardware and, and the uh, HCI. Uh, it's very capable, the implementation. Uh, it's hooked up to uh, kconfig. So when you define things like uh, number of connections that you want to have for the whole stack, the controller also makes uh, use of the same config options and uh, it will use exactly the amount of resources needed for that, uh, nothing extra. It's also very flexible, that, uh, unlike many uh, LE controllers out there, that you can do pretty much any combination of uh, connected roles. You can have multiple slave connections, you can have uh, multiple uh, central uh, master role connections, you can have combinations of those. Uh, it, the only limiting factor is how much uh, runtime memory you have and what exactly you said in uh, kconfig that you need to have. Uh, since it's coming from Nordic, the, the first radios that it's uh, supporting is uh, their radios, the NRF52 and the NRF51. But uh, we are trying to create a radio HAL uh, abstraction, so you could uh, have it run on other uh, radios as well. And uh, I expect to see that happening now. Uh, there have been a couple of uh, companies I've been talking to here at this conference, for example, that are interested in, in uh, porting this uh, link layer onto their radios. And then uh, since uh, you would have the host basically running on the same CPU. We're still using HCI between the host and the controller, but there's no physical transport as such. So we have the network buffers that are going from the controller to the host, but from the host perspective, it doesn't really matter. Is it running on the same core or uh, is it running on another core of, over some uh, physical transport? And uh, since we have all the flexibility of different features, we also have the uh, flexibility of configuring different kinds of combinations of, of uh, host and uh, controller functionality. So uh, depending on what your needs are, you can make a controller-only build, basically a, a, a HCI firmware build uh, with Zephyr. And you would have a very simple uh, application running, which exposes, uh, which hooks onto the physical transport and exposes the HCI there. Uh, we already have um, a USB sample, actually. So if you have a Zephyr uh, device which has US, uh, USB device support, you can make that into a Bluetooth uh, dongle that you can plug into your PC and, and use it like that. Uh, we're very soon going to have a uh, UART-based um, sample and a SPY-based one also. Uh, then what we were using for a long time before the controller uh, contribution came along is the uh, host-only configuration. And in this configuration, you have an HCI driver which hooks onto an actual physical uh, transport, like uh, UART, and uh, then the controller itself is, is on a different uh, core. And you can uh, build both uh, the host and the controller if you, if you want the full stack on, on a single core as well. Um, some. Uh, more details and samples of where you would actually use these different kind of configurations. Um, uh, Intel has the Arduino 101 board. It has a Nordic NRF51 controller on it, and it has a Quark SE on it. So uh, the natural thing to do is to run a controller-only configuration on an NRF51, have a simple uh, HCI over UART uh, application running there, and then run a second instance of Zephyr on the Quark SC, where you have the host-only configuration and uh, connecting to the Zephyr, second Zephyr running, running on the NRF51. Uh, Linaro announced their uh, carbon board at Linaro Connect uh, very recently. It's very similar in this sense to uh, Intel's Arduino 101. Instead of Quark SC, it, uh, it has a uh, Cortex M4. And uh, instead of UART between these two cores, it has Spy. But otherwise, uh, they actually demoed uh, the host-only configuration running on the uh, uh, the Cortex M4 and then the controller only on the NR51. And uh, then if, if you have just a single core, you can of course run everything uh, and enough memory for this also, then you can run everything on a single core. A uh, good example is the uh, NR52 from Nordic, which is more capable than the NR51. And uh, that's actually that's been used also for testing this, this new uh, uh, controller support from uh, Nordic that we run both the host and the uh, controller on, on a single board like that. Um, uh, we've been focusing a lot on uh, low energy, but uh, there can be a need uh, or want of uh, companies to create uh, dual mode solutions also. Um, 
I don't know, smart headsets or, or something like that. Or in general, if you want support for legacy devices which don't have LE support. For example, there are very few cars, uh, car kits out there that have LE support. So we've started um, implementing support for Bluetooth Classic as well. Uh, current status is that we have the generic access profile there, and we have the basic low-level protocols in place like L2CAP and RFCON. And uh, there are a couple of higher-level le profiles that we are working on, like uh, hands Profile and A2DP, which are for audio streaming, and uh, also uh, uh, AVRCP, which is for controlling the playback on a device. So. How does it look like then, uh, now on, onward? Um, after this conference, uh, it, it looks like, or it, I hope it, it, it's going to happen, that we'll be receiving more and more uh, people joining in, into the work to help out. Uh, this is a list of some of the things that, that uh, we are working on and we welcome help on. So uh, we want to make sure that whenever there are new uh, standards coming out, that Zephyr supports them as well as possible. So we are working on, on, on Bluetooth 5, which is the next Bluetooth specification coming out, on, on Bluetooth Mesh, uh, which is also supposed to be come out uh, soon. Uh, one uh, kind of challenge when it comes to an open source project and uh, upcoming standards, uh, especially Bluetooth standards, is that uh, unfortunately we cannot work in the open. So the Bluetooth SIG rule states that we, we cannot publish any uh, information that isn't public through the SIG yet. So. Uh, what we can do is, uh, until the moment that the specification goes public, is, is that those companies that are interested to collaborate on, on these features, who have access, uh, who are Bluetooth SIG members and have access to the standards, we can create uh, private repositories and, and collaborate code on there. And then once the specification goes public, we'll immediately uh, push it to the uh, public garret and, and try to get it uh, integrated there. Um, another thing uh, we want to be working on as I mentioned, is uh, porting the uh, controller support, the uh, LE link layer, to support as many radios as possible. Um, it will be an interesting test because uh, how well we define the uh, radio uh, hardware abstraction layer, because uh, the NRF51 and the NRF52 are quite uh, similar, and it's possible that they are very different looking uh, radio interfaces uh, for uh, other radios. It's possible that we need to do some extra abstractions there. I've uh, seen that some companies implement a lot of the link layer in hardware, so you wouldn't need to run it in software, and we may need to define some kind of standard uh, link layer interface, and then we can re reuse at least the HCI adaptation um, for uh, different radios, even though we don't reuse the full link layer implementation for them. Um, when uh, we initially got uh, the uh, contribution for the link layer, there was very little integration using the uh, native objects that Zephyr provides. But it, it's getting better. We've, uh, I think the HCL layer is already using NetBuff uh, natively there on, on the link layer side. But the further down we can push the uh, buffer usage, the, the, the more efficient it will become uh, because we don't need to copy data as it goes uh, up or down uh, the layers. And, uh, there are some uh, missing features we still want to implement. One is link layer privacy, which uh, basically pushes the uh, uh, identity resolution of uh, devices using private random addresses down to the controller instead of the host needing to do it. Uh, the main reason why we don't yet have it is that we just simply haven't had hardware that uh, exposes it in this interface. But uh, we should be able to do it, for example, with the link layer uh, implementation in Zephyr itself now to make sure it works. And uh, yeah, all of these are areas where we welcome anybody interested to work on them to, to join the project as, uh, as it's open. The only exception, uh, as I mentioned, are the not yet released standards where we need to simply you can contact me and we, we can arrange that we have some uh, common repository to work on, assuming that your company is a member of the SIG and has access uh, to the specifications already. And that's actually what I had. So. Welcome. Any questions if you have? <laughs> yes? Uh, you have support for NRF-52? Yes. Or yes. Have you looked into it Which one? Which NRF-52? Yeah, I've heard about it, but which uh, controller has it? Okay, so it's NRF 51 based. I, I think it should be possible. Uh, 
The um, Intel Arduino 101, it, uh, the NR51 there, it, uh, it has uh, 16 kilobytes on RAM, and, and we can at least fit the controller on the configuration there. Uh, Linaro tells me that the current build is about 13 kilobytes, so there's a little bit to go to add more stuff there if you, if you want to run a minimal host. Um, the uh, carbon board from Linaro, it has 32 kilobytes of RAM, so there you'd for sure be able to run the full uh, host. And uh, actually, m most of the uh, development kits I've seen from Nordic, uh, as well as their, uh, they have USB dongles, which have the NR51. Those are all 32 kilobyte uh, RAM variants, and I I've seen the Zephyr host running there on those. So, so I would, if it's the 32, uh, uh, is it 16? And you, and you would set the number of connections probably to one and so, so on, just to and get rid of everything unnecessary. Yeah, yeah, we would save. Basically, you wouldn't have uh, much overhead at all when you add new connections. You can do that. Any other questions? All right. Well, I'll be around. So if you have something, just come and ask me. Thanks. Thank you.